the seven major studios last year. That's 88% of the U.S. box office is the things that they put out. Um, and it was a record low in terms of how many films included us. Uh, it was 14 out of 109, which is 12.8%. Uh, and then if you, you know, really dig down deep into that, half of those films had less than five minutes of screen time for us. So if there was a queer character there at all, like we were very, you know, minimal, it would be like one scene or it would be a punchline. Um, and there was actually no trans characters in any major release last year. <laughs> and when we have had trans characters in film, you know, there's been, I think, five in the years that we've done that report. We've done six editions now uh, in major releases and every single one of them has been there as a punchline. Um, so there's a long way to go in film. Uh, you know, television is a bit of a different story. We have a lot more, you know, a lot more characters going on there. So our TV report looks at broadcast and cable and streaming. It's a, it's a lot for a two-person team to do. Um, but, you know, by representation has actually been up, you know, uh, pretty much every year the past few years, um, which is good. Um, we're super happy to see that. Out of, I think it was 390-something um, LGBTQ characters that we had across all those platforms uh, at the beginning of this past fall season, um, 93 of them, or 28%, were bi. So that's still not where we need to be. You know, Like you said, 52% of the community, we were 28%. Um, but it still skews heavily women. It was 75 women and 18 men. Um, and actually, we have seen a drop in bisexual men every year for the past three years. Uh, so we went from 23, which was already low, <laughs> um, you know, down to 19, down to 18. So that's something that we really are kind of focused on, especially uh, because we know that they're, within the next year, we're losing a few shows that have great bi men, like Crazy Ex-Girlfriend and uh, Shadowhunters are, are both ending next year. Um, but we have him or her coming, which I'm very excited about. <laughs> Um, so, you know, that's really kind of where the stats are in terms of all of that. Um, but, you know, we're also, we also kind of dig into the stories that, that we see from those characters because it's not just, you know, a numbers game. Um, and, and with that, things have gotten, you know, like you said, things have gotten better. We're starting to get a lot more, we're starting to get a lot more kind of nuanced stories. Um, but in recent years, there's still some tropes that we've seen that we're kind of tired of seeing, um, which kind of the top two are really, uh, you know, bi characters who are only ever portrayed as kind of using their sexuality or sex as like a bargaining tool or, you know, to get something and that's the only time you ever see them with a romantic interest um, is kind of in terms of transactions. Uh, and then that feeds into kind of the larger one, which is this issue of, you know, we still see so many bi characters who are, who are portrayed as kind of having inherently just like no morals and they're just manipulative and um, and that really kind of gets back to why representation matters because that kind of you know uh, so entertainment has kind of like a reciprocal relationship with society right everything that uh, comes out both like reflects our values but it also shapes our values as we watch things and we get to learn more about people who you know maybe have a different experience to us or people that we don't know so when they tell our stories you know, poorly, that has a real um, effect on our on our lived experiences, and you know that is partly why there's you know the majority of the community is bi people, but we are less likely to be out at work than gay and lesbian people, um, and it goes back to this kind of like undermining of our identity that people get from the shows and the movies and you know the music and everything that they're that they're seeing presented to them as this is what bisexuality is, this is what a bisexual person is like, um, and so that is you know, why we do this work that we do, and then we do these kind of big extensive reports, and then we're able to use those to kind of set our priorities and go in and talk to networks and studios on how to do better and, and talk about maybe voices that they're missing um, and, you know, work with them on, on that level to make sure that we are starting to get to more of where we need to be. I'm so appreciative of the work that Glad is doing and, and, and both you know, being able to watch these reports and statistics and seeing um, the importance of authentic representation. Um, all of you in, on this panel are, are out in public and you're in, in, about your bisexuality. I want to ask, and this, this can be popcorn style, um, when did you come to terms, how did you find out about your sexuality, when did you come to terms with it, and what is pushing you to be as public in this industry about it as you are? I like speaking for myself. so. When social media became what it is now, I didn't see anyone else that was doing the same, so I decided to. 
And it's interesting to now see so many other people starting to do that because it, I do think it helps people, I genuinely do. Um, especially because uh, as someone who has always been quite fluid in how she presents as well, like there are times I'll shave my head and I completely change my fashion and I just, I am a person who, as my feelings go, I present differently and it will come up again and people will push and say, oh, you're a lesbian or oh, you're, you're straight, you're just putting on a show and it's, it's not if people, at least for me, I was always this incredibly kind of tumultuous creature that sought out what I wanted to find in myself and in other people. And I didn't, I wanted to say to as many people as I could, that's completely and utterly fine. But don't tell me what I am. <laughs> like an act of resistance. <laughs> I just, uh, the idea of limiting yourself to half the population when there are so many beautiful people, uh, I just, it really strikes me as absurd. Like, I'm just gonna immediately rule out two thirds of this panel? Like, why would I do that? <laughs> It just never made sense to me. I just always like boys and girls. Like they're just people. They're all great people. They're all different. I mean, two women are just as different as any given man and woman, or two men. Like it's, I, I don't, under, I really, I don't understand. Just only one, liking one thing. I respect it. That's your choice. Like <laughs> you're born that way or whatever. Like I just, I just don't understand it. I just, I can't understand that attitude. Well, I'm curious, John, because I know that you've spoken publicly a little bit more about. Um, Sometimes you're in the last few years uh, uh, speaking more about publicly about your bisexuality. Um, in some ways, you know, you've told me privately as well, and um, yeah, I've seen you on Twitter saying that your transness has almost superseded your bisexuality for a lot of years. For the reason, do you want to speak about push well, yeah. What was the processing you speaking about that publicly more? I think my trans identity just kind of eclipsed everything else because it it's what leads, it's what comes into the room before me, and so there's really no room for discussion about bisexuality. It's it's a non-issue compared to Am I even going to be allowed to be in here at all, much less as myself? So it was very much secondary. And then as things have gotten better and I've kind of settled in, it was like, once I figured out who I was, it was because I was bisexual as a boy, too. I'd always been that way. And it's like, once I went through transition, settled into my woman, and it's like, oh, shit, I still am. Like, <laughs> that didn't change. That didn't change at all. And I, you know, it's, it's uh, I joke about this, but it's true. It's like, I've been every letter. I've been gay, I've been lesbian, I've been bi, I'm trans, I'm queer. I've dated, I've dated gay men, straight men, lesbians, uh, straight women, non-binary people, trans men and women. And they're all wonderful. It's like flavors of ice cream. I mean, <laughs> I, you know, we're gonna, I'm sure we'll talk about like the, the bad, greedy, bisexual um, trope, but I mean, you know, there's a little bit of that. I mean, Who wants cake you can't eat? <laughs> Um, but I will also say part of the reason I actually started talking about it openly, I think in part because there was a little bit of just kind of cisnormativity at work earlier in my transition where it's easier to be affirmed as a trans woman if I'm dating men. So there was that kind of like, it just affirmed my womanhood in a way that was important. Uh, but really in the last couple of years, it's been as the reports started coming out that actually proved something that a lot of us had a sense of but didn't have the data for, which is that bisexual people face uh, a kind of unique set of, of systemic oppressions, uh, both from outside and, and from within the LGBTQ community. They often feel that they're not at home in any particular place, and when the reports started coming out to show that they really had more depression and more suicidal ideation and more unemployment, all these things, I started realizing like, this is a real issue. And I know from my work in the trans community that it's largely due to representation. If you feel like you're the only one out there, if you feel like you can't speak up. So it was with those realizations that I realized I had a responsibility to be out and open about it. Um, and it also lets more people know I'm available. So <laughs> just to bring it full circle. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> um, RJ and I make a very cute couple. I, <laughs> um, I really love that a lot of you have touched on in being able to speak your truth, you're creating space for other people to be able to speak their own truths. And so I think that also ties back to why representation is incredibly important when you're able to see yourself on screen, that kind of impact it has. I'm curious if you have, um, if you have seen yourself on screen, um, when was that? What was that experience like? I watch TV all the time. I work in TV. I write, <laughs> I write TV and never seen anything remotely close. Um, so, I mean, I feel like for a lot of us, if you're uh, a white, straight person, 
for decades, TV has been a, a mirror, and for the rest of us, it's been a window where we're watching other people be represented and watching their for their experiences be uh, shown back to them. And we don't get that same experience for fulfillment. We don't get the treatment of how TV moves society along and how TV opens people's world to things and experiences and people they don't know in a different part of the world. And for so long, we've been left out of that. And so <laughs> I think for me personally, my show was a direct challenge to that, to like start pushing back against that because it's crazy that I can walk into a room of executives and say, here's a show, here's, a show, here's an idea, here's a character that's never existed on TV before in 2018. I'm curious about the process of you pitching a, a show about a black bisexual man, <laughs> knowing that the majority of the industry, obviously, as you just said, um, was in Maryland. Was there any difficulties or any, or any kind of things that you had to navigate that was different in other types of um, things um, that you worked on? Weirdly, it, it, it wasn't hard. I mean, I, I pitched to, I, I met with Issa first and Issa Rae, and we talked about the idea and we both loved it. And then we had a meeting with HBO and I, I literally said the same thing to them. I was like, this is a show about a character that's never existed on TV before. And I took like 15 minutes and explained the show. And three days later, they bought it. <laughs> and, and I think a big part of that is trying to especially now that TV is so much more competitive, that there's a lot of the same out there, and so if you have a chance to get something new and different, I think everyone's trying to jump on it, so I, um, I'll, I'll get in the door any way I can. This has to be done, and I know that there are men suffering, and who are, and I know some men who publicly only date women, but I know they sleep with men, and they would love the freedom to be who they actually are, but they're afraid. And so I feel like if you can't do it, and if there's thousands or millions of other men who feel the same way, then if I have to be the person to like kick open that door, then fuck it. I, have a, I wear a size 16, so I'll kick the door down. <laughs> Like, I remember, like, Lynn and Girlfriends, but it's, like, the blip of the storyline of her being with a woman and being best, it was, like, so, I feel like it was so small. I was so, ex and I was so hungry for it. I was, like, incredibly excited when it happened, but then it was, like, over, and there was no, like, kind of follow-through <laughs> with the story, which made me sad, you know? And I remember, like, really yearning for it. When I first um, came out of the closet and my best friend at the time, we both came out around the same time. Um, and she identifies lesbian, I identify as bi, but we, one of our friends who had been out for a while, like, got us all these movies to watch, all these lesbian movies, like, to <laughs> Education. Right, education, right? And so, like, we're the watching, starter kit. Right, except for everybody, like, jumped off a flipping building at the end, all of them, or they were sad, or depressed, or horrible, and I, I was like, dear God, and, and they were all white, and I was like, why are they so depressed, and where is our love Jones? Like, where is our love Jones? And it's like, there isn't one. And there still isn't one. That's the thing. There still isn't one, which I think is terrible. Like let it. Let me, like there aren't a lot of black black lesbian storylines, let alone black bisexual storylines. And we are we as black women, the whole Jezebel ex, ex, eroticism thing of considering us for, uh, promiscuous. Like there's certain archetypes that as black women we fit into as well. And if you also add in the bi moniker, then you've added on top of that Jezebel promiscuous idea. We're too greedy. Like all these things that nobody really wants to deal with and most people don't don't tell that story. Yeah, I think black and trans women have that particular aspect in common and that mm -hmm. we're overly sexualized for yeah. most people. And so if we bring any sexuality to something, it we don't want to conflate it with like the worst tropes. And then they it also opens the door sometimes. Like I've had people that when they find out I was bi like they either knew I was married or knew I was with some and, and all of a sudden they felt like they had permission to be more openly hit on me or to push harder with getting together with me. Like, and I'm like, yo, I already said, like, I'm not interested, not because I can't, but because I don't want you. <laughs> you know what I mean? But like, they didn't, they, it's like, they, it's like an automatic assumption. So you yeah, I'm sure we could, we've all been invited to many bedrooms of married couples. The moment that they find out unicorn. we're bisexual. Unicorn, the unicorn. Yes, yeah. the unicorn. 
Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, I was going to say, Zelda, you said you haven't um, seen it represented, but you're also yeah. taking it into your own hands in a, in a lot of it, just like Trayvon as well. Yeah, and but in, in, in different ways as well, where it's like I grew up in this industry. I'd, I'd seen it since I was a baby. And I, I used to steal my dad's scripts all the time because it's, it's quite, it's a lot easier for kids to read <laughs> scripts than most books. <laughs> they're, not, they're not usually rocket science, 90% of them don't tend to be great. But I still remember reading them and then the way women were described, it always led with physical description and that was always so confusing to me because I went, well why, you, ha you don't know who's gonna walk through the door yet. And the first movie I ever related to had nothing to do with her sexuality at all, but um, my favorite movie is Alien. So, Ripley was the first woman that, when I was growing up, there were, I was on movie sets all the time, and I, and I remember going, not a single woman here reminds me of me. And then I saw Alien, and I was like, oh shit, there's room. Um, and then when I found out that Alien was actually written with all male pronouns, but prefaced with saying not a single one of these characters couldn't be played by any nationality or any sex, um, uh, and, and I remember seeking out that script. It took forever to find it, but I was like, I, I, I needed to see that for myself. That was a thing that was my favorite movie, and I thought it was so courageous what Ripley represented for me. And then to find out that that was also part of what they'd written into this was, no, I want the best person for this part. And it had nothing to do with the gender and, and Sigourney Weaver being just this powerhouse who came in and was like, yeah, this part was written with male pronouns. It's mine, I want it. And that changed my entire perspective. And I had, one of, one of my mentors, who is an incredible man, um, told me about two years ago now, I'd hit this really low point because I kept being told, like, I'd go in for the lead part, and they go, well, uh, we have a, a lesbian best friend. And, and it had hit me so many times, and I would still happily go in for that part because I just wanted to work. I love my job. But even then, it was just, I, I didn't fit in any particular box. And he said, well, I've been doing this for 45 years. And 98% of scripts are written and directed by white men. And I can guarantee you, because I haven't, not a single one of them was going to imagine you. <laughs> you sound 40, and you look 17. <laughs> so if there's a script that you would has, have always wanted to have in your hand, and you never had, why don't you make it? And it changed my entire world. And from that point forward, like I'm making my first feature next year. I made, um, I made my first pilot this year. And I, I, write, I don't write physical descriptions in any of my scripts because why would I? I don't know who's going to be right for it coming in. Why do I need to limit what they think they should look like? And it, I can't tell you how many people will read them and have, they didn't notice. They just imagined themselves. And, well, because actors. Um, and and the, first, the first feature that I'm making, I, I'm the lead in. And it's going to be very interesting because I remember how many rooms they said that's impossible. And I went, why? They go, well, I can't think of any examples. I went, you can't think of any female examples off the top of your head. I can. But I can tell you all the male ones that you're forgetting and you loud them and give them work all the time. And one of my mentors is Taika Watiti, and he very, when, when the people gave me pushback, he said, absolutely not. That's your script, you wrote it for yourself. If you don't do it now, they'll never let you down the road. Um, and it, <laughs> I'm basically female Hannibal Lecter in it, so I don't know anyone else that wanted that as badly as I did. I like, yeah, that's, that's the script that I was like, if this is never passed in front of my hands, and I went, I'm really tired of every serial killer or killer that they make of women had to be destroyed by a man in order to be the killer that she was. I went, why can't we just be born happily psychotic? So, <laughs> you'll get to see that at some point. <laughs> uh, Jen, do you want to speak to have you, have you seen yourself on the screen have, uh, in any kind of way? But you've also, to mind. And you also like have like, um, just like Trayvon, I think, and I've seen Zelda as well, you created um, yeah. your character and her story. I mean, I mean, it does it really likes to continue to remind us. Um, was also bisexual, well, it was bisexual too. Was that um, intentional? 
And yeah, absolutely. I, again, it's just the, the whole notion of bringing yourself to the part. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I, I wrote a, a web series called Her Story, which is uh, about the lives of two trans women in LA. It did very well. Um, it's and very good. <laughs> uh, and yeah, my character, because of the plot line that my character is in an abusive relationship with a man and leaves him for a woman, I think a lot of people, particularly in queer community, thought, oh, she's coming out as lesbian. But in my mind, it was always, it's about that's a bad partner and this is a good partner, not that I'm leaving a man for a woman, I'm leaving an abusive dick for a really nice person. Mm -hmm. That's what it's about. So, and again, that, that is rendered invisible often by the kinds of assumptions that people are bringing based on their own identity and sexuality. But yeah, I was, it's pretty explicit. She mentions earlier that prior to transition, she did both men and women, so. Um, what, I, what I think is interesting about the about representation, generally speaking, which, which Megan mentioned a little bit, is that a lot of bisexual representation feeds into tropes. I think that storyline specifically, right, is reflective of a lot of the unfortunate statistics we have around bisexual women being um, at the highest rates of intimate partner violence, sexual violence, um, and domestic violence of even more than lesbian and straight women, um, that authentic storytelling then feeds into um, this kind of um, education of, 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 our, of our experience. Um, but when we do tropes, it ends up, bisexuals end up being the butt of the jokes. A lot of times, Trayvon, I'm curious, um, with your show being a comedy, how are you, I mean, how do you navigate that in terms of um, being able to joke about bisexual in a way that doesn't contribute to, or how will you at least, um, and that won't contribute to these kind of harmful tropes? I mean, for, I've seen bisexual people made fun of in a lot of like really modern comedies. Like one of the worst examples is uh, Sex in the City. You've probably seen this episode of Sex in the City. And uh, like those kind of things have been setting the tone for who we are to the world. And I think it kind of bled into like 30 Rock and New Girl and all these other shows doing the same thing where there's no one in these writers rooms going, uh, this is not like funny or like this is not how people should be portrayed. But I mean, with my show, the comedy is not about the sexuality in that way. The comedy comes from life. Like there's no joke in my show where the butt of that joke is his sexuality. It's like his friends around him are very aware of it and they support him through it. It's, it's jokes that like both affirm his identity but are also still like funny and like how friends like poke fun at each other. And so the, the, the thing I tried to do was make a show where people could see like you're not just your sexuality, like you're just a person. I get up, I go to work, uh, I go home, I go to the gym, I do all the things that everybody else does. And my sexuality plays very little role in that. And so it was a way for me to start to show people um, there's more to us than what you've been told for the last 20 years or what people think about us and that you can love a man and love a woman and you can move between those spaces and it not matter to anybody around you it's kind of almost trying to normalize it or over normalize it a little bit just so people can like get caught up in the way like will and grace brought people along with uh with gay people because even though it was like over the top and and silly it was still like people were seeing gay people on TV be people. And it moved the number, it moved the needle on people like accept, acceptance of gay people in society. And so I just started from that place of like, where do I want people to see, how do I want people to see us? And like when I get questions like from women, like, oh, I'm afraid you might leave me for a man. And, and I always say, and if I did, who gives a fuck? Like it's not like like why yeah like why is the gender of the person? <laughs> I left you. That's the problem. Like <laughs> that's what you should be. Concerned. But there like there's this shame in the idea that you were left for someone of the opposite sex. Like I would think it would hurt either way. Like I'm blessed. I'm married to my <laughs> darling wife who didn't give a shit that I was bi. Thank you. <laughs> Um, and actually li likes and supports by women, but I got so many people over the years that that was like 
their fear and they were like, well, I just, I could deal if you left me for a woman, but not if you left me for a man. And it's like, I get why? That. I, I'm no, still actually, gone. I get that though. I get that. I, mean, I remember it most particularly with a, with a woman I dated prior to transition who articulated that fear. And it's, I think it's rooted in just um, anxiety that your partner might want something that you are incapable of providing. Oh, no, I totally yeah. get that. Yeah. But I think the yeah. other side of that is that then, okay, but then you're incapable of providing, but then it's like the mind wasn't good enough that I provided because yeah. you then went to somebody who's like me. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, either way, not so great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's, an, there's a, a built-in loss that's happening that when you're going through a breakup or you're being hurt, you're looking for all, any attack on what could be the reason for what's happening to you. But I think... Uh, the idea that you, that a bi person would leave you for someone of the opposite sex because of something you can't provide is also a misconception about us. Because like, if I'm dating a woman, I'm not dating you because you're not a man. I'm dating you because I like you yeah. as a person. And if I'm dating a man, it's not because you're not a woman, it's because I like who you are as a person. So I'm not like looking to you to give me something a woman can't or vice versa. I'm just trying to like find love like everybody else. And that's kind of like what I'm trying to do with my show. It's just like, it's not about, like, I think there's a line in the script that's, um, it says something like, uh, like, uh, I don't care what's between your legs or something like that. Or like, bi people have either orgasms because we're okay with, like, <laughs> like some stupid joke like that. Like, basically putting to, to bed the idea of, like, one person can give me something, someone else, and I'm always looking for one or the other. And it's never, and it's not. It's, it's about the person. I think like the the joke thing too is an important thing to kind of go back to um and you know i think like brooklyn 99 does this so great um with like captain holt and now with rosa but like you know they make jokes about like him being gay or her being bi or whatever but like the punchline is never just oh he's gay because that's just not a good joke right. but like you know it'll be like the joke about him saying like oh we didn't know how long marriage equality was gonna last so like we went and got married and then they flash to like you know he cuts the guy off before he can give the whole thing just so they can say i do and be done with it and so it's like that kind of joke but right. it also goes back to like who's in the room and who has that like that knowledge to make it because right. if you're not in the room then there's always going to be that sense of like otherness that the writer puts on this is what we think right. kind of thing we should shout out Stephanie for yes. yeah. being so open about her own bisexuality that she was able to encourage the writers mm -hmm. on Brooklyn Nine-Nine to make that a storyline, and that she was really involved to make sure that they did it appropriately and well. Definitely. And I also, yeah, another person who I can think of is Sada Ramirez, who had a similar experience um, in kind of both being able to speak their own truths and then using their power in, in those rooms to um, then see that representation on screen. So, we sometimes forget that the longest running queer character in American television history was a bisexual Latinx immigrant, Sada Ramirez. Yeah, <laughs> she recognized more often. And uh, so I'm curious, so for our folks, and I, I'm watching time because I want to make sure we get to um, audience questions in a bit, but I, for folks who may not know who are gay or straight um, and want to create storylines that are inclusive by people um, and or fans that want to encourage uh, shows to do better. What are some best practices? What are things that um, you have found um, either be portraying bi characters or helping create bi characters? Um, what are things that people can take away um, to ensure that we have authentic storytelling? I, well, for me, I think that there's a difference between fidelity orientation and sexuality orientation, and people often conflate bisexuality with polyamory, but not all bi people are polyamorous. Some bi people are monogamous, and that there's, that's where that whole idea of like uh, everybody just sleeping with everybody, but that we're capable of being monogamous and we're capable of being poly. So it's like when you're writing, know what you're writing and just don't like put them together automatically. Like know what you're building into the character and why and like their history and who they are, so, and, and so that you're clear about that versus just creating this idea that no bi person can ever be like committed in a committed relationship with whomever. Yeah, I would also add probably like, think about, at least for like people who are writing and making shows, like if I replace this with another race or type of person, would this joke be okay? Because you'll find oftentimes it'll it'll let you know very quickly if you can get away with that if you were saying it about another group of people. Interesting. 
Yeah, and be in conversation with actual bi people. Right. You know, have that conversation in the writer's room or talk to your bi friends and make it a part of your life. I mean, I say all the time that I think writing diversity is, is a pitfall. Uh, I think you have to live diversely and then just write authentically. So um, hire bi writers. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, and for the future side, if it's just one person writing, I'm a big supporter of the immersive research thing. Uh, talk to people, have conversations, write everything down. Actually, make if you don't have a diverse enough friend group that you have someone in it that you can very uh, empathetically and and kindly but deeply have conversations with. That's saying something, but also like you can go and seek it out. Uh, you and you should. Um, especially where it's like, I don't think that necessarily everyone will write everything, and certainly every story isn't for everyone, but you can go and find those stories, and I don't know why more people don't do it. It's, it's, it's going to take you a long time to write a script as it is. You have that time. When you said when you said immersive, I would think you were encouraging people to become bisexual. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is what we're like this panel. No, I meant like so. I wrote, <laughs> yeah. I, wrote, I wrote a script about the daily lives of dominatrixes, and so I went and I spent two months in a dominatrix den. It's like you can go and find the people and say, hey, is what can I do that won't disrupt your life, that will allow me to actually authentically witness your life. YouTube is great for that too. There's no kind of identity or experience that you can't find someone on YouTube vlogging about it, and you get to hear it from like their firsthand experience. Yeah, I would say the biggest thing is like do your research, um, especially if you don't have somebody in the room. Um, and call Glad, we can help. That's what we do. Um, but yeah, really like do the research, put in the work to make sure that it's going to be as good as it can be, and not just you know you kind of coming up with, oh, this is what I think a bi person might go through, or, or what they might say, or how they might talk about their relationships. Like, go talk to somebody, and I guarantee you it will make for a better story. Um, I, I, I want to shout out, because Glad is an amazing resource. I also know that sag after has a lot of different resources for both, uh, for bi people who are in those spaces. Do you, do you want to speak a little bit about that? We, well, sag after has, a, for anybody who's experiencing harassment, anything that is untaught or not great on set, you can call, there's an emergency line. There are people there that are, that's what they're there for, is to help us and to help keep us safe on set. Um, which I would say that there's a unique set of things around, like GLAD deals with like our representation out there, and that's whether or not that role is being played by somebody who is queer or not. That That's whether it's being, the role's being played by straight, whatever. It's what roles you are capable of playing, um, but that you're safe on set, no matter what role you're playing. And I think that there's sometimes that we as bi people face unique challenges. I think like what we were talking about, about like receiving perhaps extra harassment because somebody thinks that we're more promiscuous or more open or whatever, or hearing homophobic comments and feeling not safe or not okay on set. Um, SAG has resources to help with that that you can call and get help.